Hello, my name is Jay Chauhan. I am a mentor at Angel Mentorship Group. And uh, my background is that I am a lawyer in three jurisdictions, England, India, and Ontario. And uh, today's topic is the subject of uh, employment law from the perspective of the employer as well as the employee. So first I want to give you a background of the, the, the way in which the employment law is taught in the schools. And I want to cover both the lawyers and paralegals as well. So I work with uh, Humber College with their students. I have article many students and I have been a deputy judge for 24 years and have made many decisions with respect to how this law plays out, both from the theory point of view, as well as the practice point of view. So that's the focus of the meeting today. So let me just give you a brief background of the way in which the law is taught and how the lawyers and paralegals react to the advisory function of the lawyer and the paralegal. So the first thing I want to explain is that um, the subject is taught in terms of the nitty gritty law, such as for example, that employment is a contractual relationship. If you hire somebody, then that person contractually is bound to carry out the terms of the employment and uh, the two parties are both bound by the, the employment contract, although in reality, as uh, you might all experienced as an employer, employee, or even a lawyer or a paralegal, that the employer has an advantage because his career is not on the line, but that of the employee is on the line when you deal with the employment contract. So most of the time you will see in practice that it is the the employer's position, which is more dominant, even though in a contract, so to speak, the parties are supposed to be equal. And you had the freedom to make the decision to be the employer and employee, but the employee is in a weaker position. So you must accept more or less what the employer is doing or asking him to sign on the employment contract. So the, the teaching of the law is based on the employment contract and the way the law has evolved. So let's go back to England where the employment law, which is applied in, in uh, Commonwealth jurisdictions applies. So there used to be in the older time, uh, if you see the case law, the relationship of the employer and employee was that of a master servant type of a relationship. Over the years, this has evolved into employer-employee relationship where gradually the ability of the employee to be uh, decision-making and more equalitarian, but, but not quite equal, has evolved in, in the law. And in more recent times after the corona, the feeling that the employee wants to do what he wants to do and, and wants to have the freedom to do what he wants to do has increased quite dramatically, especially in North America. So I want to review the way in which the, the law plays out its role and how the lawyers and paralegals make their decisions in advising the client. So having said what the legal system teaches in your JD program or the LLB program, if you were in India uh, or England, but in Canada, this program has become a JD degree, Juris Doctor degree. And uh, in that training program, uh, the essential uh, part of the teaching is based on the contractual relationship. But there is not an explanation behind the scenes of how the psychology of the individual works out and how the psychology of the employer and employee work out in the relationship. So, and I, I think, so just to start with the psychology aspect of it, the employer more or less dictates to the employee 
what the employee is supposed to be doing in the hours that he allocates to the employment uh, of the employee with the employer. So very typically, as the time frames of the hours have evolved uh, after the Industrial Revolution, it is more or less about 40 hours for uh, the employee to work and uh, employer to be able to dictate what he should ask the employee to do in the time frame. And the career of the employee hinges upon the, the success he makes within the framework of the employer's goals as to what he would like to achieve. And he, of course, as an employer, is in a, in a society which has the competition as the basic principle of how he succeeds in the marketplace. So the employee is working to achieve the employer's goal in the marketplace and uh, allowing the employer to use his mind and ability uh, in terms of how he competes in the marketplace to produce his goods or services to compete successfully and be the best one or the, you know, the one that he can market his goods and services in the marketplace. So that's roughly how the relationship works out. So higher up you go in the employment arrangement, more freedom you get, but you always remain within the framework of the thinking of the employer. So I think in terms of the, the actual application of the law is something very different actually. So how does a lawyer or paralegal get involved in this kind of a, a situation of the employer-employee contract. So I recently had the opportunity to work on a statement of a claim in the wrongful dismissal case. That's typically how the lawyer or paralegal will get involved in the situation. So in Ontario, um, the small claims court has jurisdiction up to the sum of $35,000 and uh, that is uh, the jurisdiction of the small claims court. In this court, the principles of the law that apply are exactly the same as any superior court except for the amount of the claim that you can assert. So the claim is usually asserted by the employee. When the employee is terminated, then he feels unhappy and he then wants to bring an action in the court system against the employer or usually it is wrongful dismissal. So the whole law of wrongful dismissal has evolved and that's how the lawyer or paralegal get involved in that uh, situation. There are many, many variables that can arise within the framework, but the framework essentially is that the employee says in the litigation, in the statement of claim, that you fired me wrongfully and therefore I make a claim. So. I just want to give you a little background of the framework within which this statement of claim is prepared and what the lawyer does, the paralegal does to advise the client in that situation. So if that happens, uh, meaning that an employee has been terminated, what does the lawyer advise? What does the paralegal advise to the employee is to determine what are the rights of the employee in that situation. So I'd like to clarify that in all the jurisdictions, mostly in the current uh, uh, time frame in, in the history of the employer-employee law, the, the common law essentially centers around the time frame in which the employee is terminated with pay. So the question mostly is how much pay is the employee entitled to in the claim is the advice that the client is looking for. So from that point of view, what I would uh, like to suggest is that you're looking to see which what jurisdictions in respective areas of the different Commonwealth countries, the judges are willing to provide. So if you look at the case law, you'll see that in, uh, in, in Ontario, which is more or less the leading jurisdiction in Canada, it sets the example of what is it that you can reasonably claim and succeed in claiming if 
the person was wrongfully dismissed. Wrongfully means that uh, the employer says that for whatever reason is terminating the employment of the employee. In the best case scenario, the employee is entitled to a roughly one month of uh, salary for each year of work. So if you have been employed for a time frame of 15 years, then you may reasonably expect at least 15 months of compensation. Within the framework of that relationship, you're negotiating with the employer. So how does an employee negotiate through the lawyer or paralegal and, and advise the client is based on a number of factors that basically amount to the negotiations between the lawyer of the employee who becomes the plaintiff lawyer and the lawyer of the company that is the target or the defendant in the action. So if you negotiate, you have to keep in mind that this is the part that is not taught in the law school, which is the employer usually is a larger organization and more resources they, and they have. And then the lawyer is in touch with his client who is the employer for some time and have developed a good relationship whereas the employee has looked up in the yellow pages or Google these days, the name of a lawyer who can bring an action. So there is a dynamics of the relationship and negotiations which are not necessarily equal because the role of the lawyer in the technical legal system is become quite important. And therefore, what are the tactics that you can employ from procedure point of view or even the substantive law point of view are very significant from the result that you can obtain. But within the framework of the employment law, the results you can obtain are not very largely different, actually, than the amount of time frame you can gain in the negotiating process. But the thing to keep in mind is the dynamics of the relationship. So the employee comes to you as a lawyer or paralegal and is asking you, what can I get? How can I bring an action? How quickly can you bring it? And at that time, it's important to remember that very often the employer has not paid him, and therefore the employer is looking for a release from the employee, and then the employee brings the release, a draft release to you as a lawyer or paralegal, and asking you to review that. And when the whole chapter opens up as to what the rights are of the employee, in that situation of wrongful dismissal. At this juncture, I might just point out that the, the uh, dismissal can be for just cause or a regular termination of employment. Important to keep, thing to keep in mind is that the employers have a right to terminate the employee because it is not possible in the modern economy to have somebody remain employed for life because the economy is changing, the companies are changing, and the product of goods that you produce are changing. And in that environment, if the employer is deciding to do some changes, then very often for the employer, the employee is just a number, just like financial number, which is the instrument through which the employee is making money. And he will basically determine that he wants to terminate the employment. So the employee lawyer uh, engaged by the employee is negotiating the framework of whether the is a just cause or a regular termination of employment. If there is just cause, meaning a reason why you should be terminated, then the, the termination does not require a payment to the employee and a good situation of that kind is to understand the situation of uh, fraud, for example. So I had a situation of a bank employee whose signature was found on a reference letter which he had not produced, but the bank felt that it would be better for their employment uh, record and image to terminate the employee's uh, term, you know, employment and, and, and then let the person go. So that situation, is an example of whether the person was rightly dismissed or wrongly dismissed. 
and therefore there is a claim arising from the fact that the person needs a time frame in which the person can change the employment and uh, and basically um, look for new employment with another employer. So that's the scenario in which the lawyer is acting for the client and advising the client as to what he can do. And I think that uh, the law schools are not going to teach you the psychology in terms of what happens in the mindset of the employee. So for the employee, the whole identity of the person is in question when the termination happens. It is not the case with the employer. So the employee is in a very morally uh, and psychologically weaker position when you're advising him. He's also unemployed and waiting for the money to arrive and he's without money. So some of the lawyers might even work on a and like some kind of contingent arrangement, but it is my view that the contingent arrangement is more workable in the American jurisdiction than, than the Canadian jurisdiction, because the, the American courts are more likely to give bigger damages than the Canadian courts. But to give an example of how you can assess it, I, I would like to refer to you to think about uh, three jurisdictions that I'm familiar with. I'm called the bar in uh, India, England, and also Ontario, and I can tell you the comparison roughly of the culture of these three jurisdictions. And I am reasonably familiar with the American jurisdiction also. So I can give you the four jurisdictions as to how each jurisdiction will play out in terms of the lawyer advising the client. If you, at one extreme is the Indian jurisdiction, which is changing, but I think the employment law of the Indian jurisdiction essentially is uh, likely to be more in favor of the employee who depends heavily on the job and to support the family and the culture of the law, even if it is the same as the English law, will be differently decided on by the judges because the judges know that the employee needs the job and the law also in the wording heavily emphasizes the protection of the right of the employee. So if you're advising in the Indian jurisdiction, you would advise of the possibility of the employee getting more from the security of the job in the compensation he gets at the termination period. The English jurisdiction is somewhat also um, more lenient in favor of the employee and more sympathetic. As you come to Canada, the the amount of compensation more or less would be based on the right of the employer to terminate, the right of the employee to look for compensation within the parameters that I indicated to you, namely roughly a month per year of employment, and the reason if there is any for the termination of the employment. So, and if you look at the American jurisdiction, that there is going to be um, essentially less emphasis on the right of the employee because the economy is changing more rapidly and the termination is more likely to be um, available to the employee and he is required to look for another job if the situation changes for the employer in the technology or some of the macro production of goods and services which can very much quickly change the scenario for the employer to be able to employ the employee. So these are the jurisdictions. So when you are the advisor in each jurisdiction, it is important to recognize in the, in the advisory function, the, the legal cultural point of view, meaning that how is the court likely to give you the answer? And after reading all the case law, and very often how the compensation is decided on it determined on the, on the nature of the relationship at a particular time in the economic development of that particular jurisdiction that we're dealing with. So I think that the law schools do not teach you that particular broader perspective of the economics that are needed to be understood by the lawyer in terms of how to react to the decision of advising the client as to what he should expect and how to use different tactics in the law for the purpose of negotiating a resolution of the problem. In a more concrete fashion, when I was dealing with somebody recently on what to, how to understand the dynamics of the negotiating process, my view is that 
in the employment law, I, more specifically Ontario, where I practice almost 50 years, my view is that you will end up advising the client to accept a reasonable amount of compensation and the leeway permissible to find a resolution of the amount that could be given to your client for compensation is somewhat limited. So it is not a good idea, in my view, for a lawyer or paralegal in Ontario to try to raise the expectations of the client using different procedures for the purpose of resolving the issue. The employer, as I said before, is in a stronger position. Your client is not in a strong position. So if you're acting for the employee, then you have to bring that to the attention of the client. It affects your fees as well, because your fees uh, you know, may be contingent upon the, the amount that is uh, paid to the client. You might want to get a direction from the client to have the fees paid to your trust account. And then from trust account, you take out the fees and give the rest to the client. In that scenario, if you use a procedure for the purpose of gaining advantage, let's say you change the statement of claim and amend it or change it or include the human rights issues, it does give you some kind of leverage in negotiating with the employer. The employer do, does not want to bring the human rights issues uh, because it affects the reputation of the employer in terms of how the employer treated the employee. Now, this is very big in the U.S. It is uh, also significant in Ontario, and uh, it is not as significant in the Indian jurisdiction, but are, uh, are issues that you might have to think in terms of how you draft the statement of claim. If you do go in Ontario, if you ask the Human Rights Commission, and then, uh, you know, then you are stuck in terms of asking the Human Rights Commission to deal with the issue in which even the cost of the lawyer is not a big significant factor, but uh, the lawyer or paralegal may still be involved in the process and you have a, a, a different uh, fee structure that you might be involved in. If you're in a regular court system and include the human rights issue, then it simply complicates the issue. So if you see the release that is granted by the, by the employee or requested by the employer's lawyer, is very often lengthy two-page agreement in which the employer will say that I forgo all my rights in the arrangement with the employer so that he will not bring any action in the Human Rights Tribunal uh, after the settlement is made. So I reviewed the jurisdictions to you with you for the purpose of explaining that it's very helpful to understand the cultural context of each tribunal, each tribunal meaning the jurisdiction and the role of the judges and how they perceive the resolution of this problem in advising your client. So more experience you have, the better it is for you to understand how the judge is likely to react because your advice is based on what the judges are likely to do if you take the matter to the, to the court. So I just want to touch upon the question of the current uh, ethos of the employees that has evolved since the corona period. If you see the North American jurisdiction, there is a very large number of employees who are now saying that we would rather work on as independent contractors than the as an employee role. That particular evolution of the economics of the society is changing more dramatically. North America is moving into Europe as well, is slowly coming into India. And that ethos being that you have to give today much more recognition to the employee than you ever had to do in the past. Because I think in the, in the industrial societies, we have reached a point where making a living is no longer a major issue, but the fulfillment of the expectations of the employee and his wishes or her wishes are very much more significant. So if you are the employer, you need a much more understanding and a compassionate role in dealing with the employee's situation. And that includes allowing the employees to work out of home, to work with more privileges, much more assertion of the individual identity, preferences, and allowing the employee to, to reach their goals of what they can achieve for the organization in a much more flexible manner. 
and respecting and appreciating the employee's efforts is absolutely fundamental for the modern employer. So I think these things of the psychology of the relationship is something that you will not see in your training program of JD program in the legal system of teaching. But I think it's very important for you as a lawyer practicing to be sensitive so that when you see a client who is distraught at the termination of the employee, and then you're advising such a person, that compassion that you can show can be very significant in your relationship with him and how he refers other clients to you. I think in terms of the important thing uh, to recognize also in your advisory function to the employees, also understanding the taxation law and uh, how the lump sum received for the termination of employment will be treated in uh, the tax law of the jurisdiction where you are working as a, as a lawyer in the advisory function you perform in that jurisdiction. If you move the function into the arena, function of the employee into the arena of independent contractor, which is where the economies are moving, uh, then I think that uh, you're not too worried about the arrangement and the, the independent contractor being the employee, but he now works as an independent contractor working from home or with his own company name. There are much many more deductions that you can take and, uh, and, and therefore he will be responsible for the, the relationship in terms of the taxation to the tax department. So the person who is independent is entitled to take out the, all the expenses that he needs to incur for the purpose of carrying out his employment. It's very important in the employment law to recognize and understand the principles in which each person is considered to be independent contractor or in the category of the employee. Employee relationship uh, follows the historical norm of the control of the ability of of the employer to dictate to the employee what he's going to do. It also depends on the number of people you have that you can show who are the, the employees of their employer. If you are an employee working as independent contractor but have only one employer, you might find that at least in Canada, you might be questioned whether you are independent or have rearranged the arrangement of the relationship into the independent contractor role by simply putting in clauses that make you look like a self-independent person, but in reality, you are dependent. So in that case, the employer can end up being asked to pay the, the, the deductions that you're supposed to make and remit it directly to the tax department. So it's very important how that particular independent contract relationship is defined and defined in a way in which it does not offend the tax law. So you have to get to understand how and when the tax department is going to consider the employee as an independent contractor or an employee. So I think the whole big chapter by itself, which I won't deal with it in this uh, meeting today. So I think that would more or less cover the main issue that I want to cover in this particular talk, and namely the evolving relationship of employer-employee and uh, how that plays out in the role of the lawyer in advising the client in various jurisdictions. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture. And uh, this is designed not only for the lawyers, paralegals, but also the client. So how do clients benefit from these lectures is to understand the legal principles of the law, which enables you as an employee to make your decisions correctly when you are finding new employment or when your employment is terminated and how to deal with the legal system. Because if you're not sensitive about the legal system and how the law is making the decisions within the framework of the legal system, then you will not have the advantage of having the best uh, work, uh, legal system working for you. So, so this, these lectures are designed um, for both all the people concerned to make them sensitive about how they make the decision. So essentially, when the lawyer is playing the role, he's using his legal knowledge and experience to advise the client in all those situations of employer-employee relationship. 
Thank you.